uh, today I'm very excited. We have my good friend Patrick Luke in the house. Actually, I'm in his house of worship or whatever you want to call it. So uh, my buddy Patrick Luke is a, a rock star photographer in uh, the Rochester, New York area, Fairport, New York to be exact. And I'm very excited to interview him because he's the exact opposite photographer of me. So, uh, and also he's just as chatty. So this might be long, so settle in, but feel free to listen to it like a podcast. Get yourself a drink. Yeah, get a drink, cause, uh, but it'll be really fun. I'm excited. What we're gonna talk about today is his long transition from a full-time corporate job, like a normal person job, nine to five, that he liked. It was great, he made decent money and blah de blah but he decided to follow his heart eventually and open a photography studio. And of course, I always knew he would crush it and he has been. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about his journey, uh, any advice he has for anyone like listening at home that wants to make photography a career. Uh, obviously we're gonna get into his pricing a little bit because that's my favorite thing to talk about. And then uh, there'll give me a lot of random stuff in between. <laughs> so uh, yeah, anyway, so without further ado, Patrick Water, Patrick. I've never called you that. Call my mother calls me Patrick. You can too. <laughs> that sounds about right. So Pat Luke is what we all call him. So Pat, uh, why don't you just give us like a little synopsis of like how you even got into photography and then uh, just a quick overview of like your journey that we're going to get into today. You know, as, as a high school student, I always thought I had an eye for taking pictures and seeing like little, the little spots in, a, in an environment that was really kind of cool. And I was interested in, in landscape and wildlife photography, things like that. And so instead of learning about photography, I just bought a camera and said, okay, now I'll learn. And I was senior year of high school. Within two months, no, sorry, within a week, I was on the yearbook staff. Within two months, I started shooting for the local newspaper doing sports with an all-manual, advanced, manual focus camera. And within a year and a half, I started doing weddings. And I did weddings. You were how old? I was 21. Wow. Uh, actually, no, I was 18. I did my first wedding at 19 years old. And I did weddings for over 20 years. Uh, Part-time photographer, my background's in biology. Uh, I was an environmental scientist for 12 years. I did software engineering at Kodak and Fujifilm for another 12 years. And after 23 years of being a part-time photographer, I decided to give Corporate he USA the heave-ho and walked away from almost a six-figure salary to take my business full-time. And it was a uh, numbing experience and it was with no guarantees whatsoever, but uh, I'm 10 years on my own now. Uh, Has it really I, been 10 years? It's been 10 years. I quit in 2010, yeah. April, oh, so yeah. it's just been over 10 years. High five. Um, yeah, really, yeah it's, awesome. it's, it's a big deal. I mean, the last 10 years already is a, is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, and at the time, my wife was not fully on board with it because, I would, again, I was making a lot of money. And I told her, you got to give me two years to get a commercial studio, and I need five years to get X amount of the salary that I was making before. And I beat the goal on both. I, I got the studio in 18 months instead of two years, and I met my salary goal in four years instead of five. And I've been growing ever since. The business went up 600% overnight the first year I moved into the studio. So I worked at home for the first two years in a home studio, home office, home studio, and then I got this studio space. And I went from 400 square feet to 2,000 square feet studio, and now I'm at 2,300 square feet of studio. Uh, a lot of rent, but um, it is all paid off. I have no regrets whatsoever. Yeah. It is smartly too. That's, the idea. That's why we're here. That's right. exactly why we're here. I mean, when you were transitioning, obviously we were hanging out a lot. We were both members of Greater Rochester Professional Photographers. That's how we met, uh, which is an affiliate of Professional Photographers of America. And I've done a lot of videos on that on my YouTube channel. So feel free to take a look and why we're, why we're doing that. Like both uh, Pat and I are certified professional photographers. CPP with um, PPA, so there's a video on that. Um, but uh, but anyway, when you were going through that transition, I remember that we were all just like, Psh, do we need to talk to your wife? Like, of anybody in the world, we have, there's no doubt that you're going to be able to crush it. Like, we just knew, and we'd seen you, you, we'd seen you behind the scenes that a spouse doesn't have access to as part of it. Um, and it didn't personally affect us <laughs> if it didn't work out. So it's a little easier for us to cheer you on too. I mean, all I, my I, friends had 150% confidence totally. in me. My wife had probably 75%, but yeah. I was just kicking her that last 25%. Totally. But you know, we, we did it, we, we rationalized and we spent four months planning and we looked at our expenses and what we needed to make every month to cover what to live like we normally had. You mean math? Yeah, actual I, math and, no, and planning thing. and budgeting and all that. <laughs> yeah. And when I realized how much my wife's a teacher and she had a very stable salary, when I realized how much I had to kick in to keep us at that stable environment, I go, I should have done this 20 years ago. 
And so I just we just said, okay, let's do it. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. What, um, you know, it's, I'm gonna actually do it a little backwards from what I thought. What did you keep you from doing it 20 years before? Self-doubt. Uh, I enjoyed my jobs that Which, I Which, knowing you, I'm gonna say that that's actually very surprising because yeah. you come across as probably the most confident, per- not arrogant, but like the most confident person I know. Yeah, um, I'm confident but cautious. Yeah. I'm always that way. I always look at risk and reward. There's a risk and a reward to doing everything. Mm-hmm. And I will always, I always hope for the best, but I plan for the worst. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's my cautious way of approaching anything. And if it's worth a risk, just go full high at it. Yeah. And so what, what was keeping you in that little bit of doubt that kept you in your safe job? Not to be a therapist. This yeah, is yeah, a yeah, little yeah. bit of a therapy, therapy house session, that I put right? you on, too. Um, Sorry. We've actually never talked about this, so that's no, why I'm excited. Um, <laughs> because I was always averse to risk. And, and going in, you know, walking away from a six-figure salary, doing something that was no guarantee to is a pretty big risk. Mm-hmm. And, and also, being the treasurer of GRIP, you understood that most right. full-time photographers don't make six figures take home. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and most most businesses fail in the first two years, most new businesses. Now, I wasn't a new business, but I expanded, and most businesses like this will fail in the first five years. So if you make five years, you're doing well. Mm-hmm. And every one of my friends says, Pat, do it, do it. Everybody says, you got to do it. And I finally, because I'm on a speaking tour, I go around, I speak to professional photographers. And after having 75 people saying, how come you're not full-time already? Yeah. I found said, okay, maybe I should do this. Yeah. And I the kick in the ass you needed. Yeah. yeah. I mean a lot of people lose their jobs and that's a kick in the butt. But, right. but you, I walked away from a really good job. Yeah, and you liked your job. So I liked my job. I think but that's I love that's this. important to talk about too. You know, that it's not like you didn't love it. Um, and I, I I think that's huge. I mean, and I feel that way about not doing weddings anymore. Like that's mm-hmm. my wheelhouse. I love doing them, but there's there's a I don't know if you've ever read this book and I don't know why I'm going on this tangent, but there's a book called The Big Leap. And um, it's been a really cool book to read, but it's basically like you have your zone of excellence and you have your zone of genius. And for me, I've always felt like a phone of uh, being a photographer was like a zone of excellence, but not genius. Like I feel like I have more to do or something bigger to do, even though I love doing weddings. Yeah. But so anyway, it's kind of the same sort of thing. Like you were good at your job, you liked your job, but now you're like living the dream yeah. and making it not only work, but thriving. Right, and, my, and at the time when I was part-time, my, my photography was good. It wasn't great, it was good. Because I was working basically from eight o'clock at night till two in the morning on weekdays and once in a while on the weekends. Uh, and it wasn't until I quit my job and did this full time that people notice, holy cow, Pat, your work is getting really good because I was dedicated to it. I wasn't only Put working, hours. I was tired. Yeah. I was fresh and, and my mind started racing on what I can do and I immediately started taking risks and yeah. people are thinking, looking at my picture going, how did you ever think of that? And it's like, well, I freed my mind up of everything else mm-hmm. and I dove head first right into yeah, and you're passionate about it. And one thing that's really fun about Pat is that he makes a lot of his own equipment or he builds his own stuff, uh, if, you know, like um, even just racks for his tripods or whatever. And then also he makes his background. So he's like made this background that's sitting behind him uh, today. This is something he made, what, over the winter, this winter? Yeah, I, I painted it uh, about a week and a half over the spring. I painted It's all hand-painted. All the modeled panels behind me are all hand-painted. And then I painted and installed all the molding around them too. But yeah. it's a nice, it's just a nice feature wall. And it's yeah. because it's a neutral gray that works with almost anything. So I wanted to make sure it was going to work with anything. So another thing I want to talk to you about, just to kind of pivot a little bit, because it's um, something I find interesting about you personally as a photographer. And what I alluded to at the beginning is that we are the opposite type of photographer. So I thrive under pressure of like, let me chase someone and try to light that as I go and get them to take it and take a picture. So that's really fun for me. And like to get it later and be like, hey, I came out. Cool. Or when did I take that? Like, that's really rewarding for me as a photographer. But with you, you're a traditional studio photographer who loves lighting and gear. And I'll do a tour of all his toys um, and I'll show you at the end a quick tour of his studio. But um, I just want to have you talk about, you know, that your style of photography is old school or out of fashion in a sense, um, but you make it extremely fresh and modern and a completely new take on it. Uh, and you're, like I said, thriving. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's an older school philosophy on setting up lights and bringing two and three lights on location. What it comes down to is that I know the gear so well. I know what I'm doing so well. And it's become just experience, just doing it and doing it. So I'm not taking 15 minutes to set a light up. I'm taking three minutes. 
and I get it and I'm talking to the customer the whole time, my client who I'm photographing, so they don't get bored and get on their phone and start playing and doing something. I'm always engaging them the whole time. And I know I know how to set the lights from experience. I know they're on quarter power at this far away. And I just go with it. And I rarely I rarely have to do more than just one change of the light. I get it in the right position, I know where the light needs to be and things like that. If it is, one quick change and we go. If it's not working, I will take it out of the equation because I don't want to just, my, not, my mind is not getting the right light, it's getting the client. So if it's not working, I move on and do something else or just continue what I'm doing. Yeah. So, so I, and I keep it fresh but by keeping it still fast paced and I, mm-hmm. I work pretty fast paced. Yeah, and even in the studio too, yeah. like, like one of the reasons we set up here is that I love available light, like most people do, it's just really flattering, but he has this huge bank of windows here and then to keep it simple, because I'm influencing him just this much is that we just have two reflectors on us, like huge reflectors, and we didn't overcomplicate it. Uh, and and the chairs we chose, I'm just going to talk about this real quick, just for fun. Uh, so the chair he's sitting in, I gave him, <laughs> and the chair I'm sitting in, he bought for me. <laughs> so it's just fun. I was like, you know what? Let's use these fun chairs that I forgot that I loved. <laughs> So one thing that's really cool, let's talk real quick about how you build your own stuff, like where you get your creativity, build backdrops. Uh, I mean, obviously it comes from having an engineer's brain, but go ahead and just like chat about that for a second. Okay. I, like I said, I, I've got a master's in biology, so I'm a science, I'm an engineering kind of guy, but I also am nerd. a nerd, geek, nerd, <laughs> come, I, I full will take everything you call me <laughs> Put it in the best be, possible way. because it's all deserved. Yeah. Uh, so I have that background, but I also have the obviously very creative background in the art mm-hmm. side. So... Um, you know, I started making frames. I was like 12 years old and I started cutting miters for frames and making my own frames and things like that. So um, I just tend to roam through Home Depot and Lowe's looking at hardware and pieces that eventually I'll need. And when I have an idea for something, I'll get an idea and it'll just ruminate in my brain for about four months until I get another piece, another step on the process. And when I have all the pieces together, I go ahead and make it. And sometimes I go through a ver- one or two versions of it till I get it how I want to do it. But what it comes down to is that the piece of equipment, whatever it is, has to do a job. It's not, you know, if you look at a softbox, or there's nothing magic inside a softbox. It's a light, it's an enclosure, and there's diffusion material. When you look at the basics of what it is, that's what I do is I break things down and then figure out how to make it myself. And I use cheap equipment like foam cord that you can get. I use cardboard covered in aluminum foil as reflectors for small product photography, things like that. Um, I've made battery packs for lights. I've made all sorts of things, but it's just thinking about how what the, what the tool has to do and then make it to do that work. Yeah, exactly. And that helps your bottom line. It does. I mean, I, I've saved thousands and thousands of dollars by doing it myself. And when I worked in a home studio, my studio was 12 feet wide and 20 feet long, and I only had six and a half foot tall ceilings. So I had to work within the constraints of that small area, and whatever I built had to be small, portable, fold flat up against the wall. So I take that all in the design characteristics and what I was thinking about doing. So I, I, I painted my own backgrounds on plywood and, and you know muslin, or I went to go to the store and buy muslin, which is a lightweight canvas, and paint my own stuff on plywood. So it had to be small and portable, uh, and the lighting material all had to be small and compact or fold up or whatever against the wall. So I worked in a very small place and I didn't have a lot of money. I have always gone with the philosophy of don't spend it if you don't have it. I don't like going into debt. So whatever I had, I would spend a little bit more. Um, I know photographers that have gone into deep debt and it put, ultimately put them out of business. I've never carried a loan. My credit card bills are paid off almost every month. About once a year, I'll carry over a little bit, one month to pay it off. But I always work within my budget uh, so I don't extend myself too far. Which obviously is something I talk about on my channel all the time. And I've been one who've overextended during different points in my career. So I can attest to that, that it's better to just be on the cash basis if you can. And uh, a lot of photographers buy fun toys for themselves that don't have serve a purpose. Um, or they need they think they need a new lens that like your clients don't care <laughs> It's like if it's is it for you or is it for your work? Is it really so there's a lot you of that to be careful there are, there are needs and there are wants mm-hmm. And everybody has wants, but if you only fulfill the needs uh, Then you're you'll you'll be in better yeah. shape And that's one of the reasons that with my channel I don't do a lot of t- tech tutorials is because I don't buy a lot of gear I use my camera until it dies. I I make it work, you know, I still can print big, I still can do what I need to do, but I'm not gonna go buy the next lens or the next camera just because it's new. Um, And that's always been my philosophy in that way for sure, especially with equipment because it's a bit, it's a huge expense. Um, So let's talk about pricing. Let's just like springboard right into that. So you're mostly portraits, uh, senior portraits and family portraits, but uh, also a lot of sports stuff, right? 
like school sports, like teams? Yeah, yeah about two-thirds of my income is our high school senior portraits. Mm-hmm. Uh, about 15% is business portraits. Another 15% are high school level sports, not high volume sports like Little Leagues. But I do varsity, JV level, level sports, but I photograph them in a way that makes them look like professional athletes as opposed to staying in line, click, move along, next one. That's why I don't like high volume. Yeah, like uh, we'll do a slideshow at the beginning, which, so if you're watching this, you probably have seen it. And then um, at the end also we'll do a studio tour too. So, um, but what what's really cool about his sports photography is it looks like magazine, like Sports Illustrated, like it's gor- gorgeous, like really they look like athletes. So. Um, that's actually helped you set yourself apart too. Yeah. So do you find your, have you leaned into that with your pricing? Not so much, uh, and, and you're probably gonna disagree with me on that, but I look at my sports, because I'm dealing with JV and varsity level sports, these are these are ninth graders and 10th graders who want, I want to be interested in my business, Luke Photography. So sports photography is a different beast than my senior portraits, and, and there is a, there's a cut point where it's just not gonna, they're not gonna pay for it. So I use it as a lead-in. Okay, I was gonna say, is it a loss leader? Yeah, yeah. So, not a loss leader, I'm still yeah, making yeah. money. I'm not sure. making a huge amount of money, right. the, the ratio that I wanna You're make. You're not trying to squeeze every penny out. Exactly. Yeah, right. Exactly, um, but you know, you know, my top package, you know, it might be $40, mm-hmm. but I average, you know, for a team, you know, my average sale for each, each athlete depends on the sport and the level, but it might be $25 to $30. But if you've got 25 kids in a team, you're gonna profit a little bit. Uh, but that's a lead-in. These kids know me for two or three years be- before they are ready to- for senior portraits. Mm-hmm. And I work with about four different school districts in the area here, including the, my home school and the studio and the, the town I'm in. But now they know who I am through my sports. And then they're interested in me for senior portraits and it leads right into that. Yeah. And that's where I make money. Yeah, so it's like marketing. So it's, it's, a, it's a marketing push to do the sports. I mean, I happen to love sports. I love, mm-hmm. I was an athlete. I played all sorts of sports when I was a kid. I still compete. This will be the first year in 47 years I haven't played ball over the summer because of the COVID yeah. uh, restrictions. But I still, I played a lot of sports, so I know the athletes. Um, but it's, a, it's an interest. It gets them interested in the studio. It gets my name out there because of the great sports stuff I do. And it's part of my marketing process. So I consider it marketing, but I'm making money at the marketing instead of spending yeah. it on marketing. And let's talk about your marketing for your seniors too. I mean, we don't have to share all the ins and outs and all the nitty, nitty gritty details, but talk a little bit about your high school senior program in case somebody's watching who thinks is thinking about doing a rep program. Yep, so I do two. I, explain what that is real quick and yeah. then. Yeah, so I do two things. It's, it's a model ambassador program and it's social media, all right? Um, I work with kids that are juniors who are upcoming for the senior portraits and I do, I do an app but these are mostly kids on social media I find them on social media I look for kids that are fans of the studio so you go find oh okay no I, I what I do is I, I put an application out on my Instagram page mm-hmm. uh, that has them fill out uh, an application on my on my website and I invite the kids and a parent to an informational meeting here at the studio give them all the information about what it is and basically what they are if they're on my model team that's what I call it, kind of a model team, you can call it a, a, an influencer team, whatever it is, they're ambassadors for the studio. They get two sessions, I photograph them the first time, typically between March and June, which I'm pretty slow time anyway, so if I can get pictures out on social media, uh, the first uh, showing of all these kids. Then they come back for a second session sometime between June and August, when the rest of the people are starting to be interested in photography and senior portraits. So I have two sets of pictures for each of these kids that are out in social media. They're sharing with their friends, they're putting on their story, and they're getting all their friends interested in senior portraits. So when there's the, the kids are interested in senior portraits and their mother says, oh, where should we go? I know, let's go to Luke Photography. So these kids are sharing it, and these kids this year are huge fans of the studio, and I love these kids. There's only 12 kids but they're a team of 25 because they do twice as much work. They're sharing everything. They're sharing their friends and other model team from other schools are sharing their work. So they're, they're being the voice of Luke Photography. And if you are a high school student, you're gonna to listen to your friend more than you're gonna to listen to me tell you how great I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, but their friends will tell you how great the experience is. The, they can see how good the pictures are. So that's a big part of it. I've been doing that kind of a program for about eight years in that aspect, quite like that. And the kids, they wanna do it. They, they, they don't get paid, they pay to be part of the program. It's a lower fee than what everyone else would pay, but they get a lot of extra stuff. 
and and depending how many kids of their friends they get to come to they earn points and at the higher point levels and hierarchy they earn money now money talks they want money so they'll do more just to get these points and I keep them on board and I also um, as a team as a team effort to kind of push them into doing and sharing more I do what I call a lollipop challenge the lollipop um, lollipop farm is a humane society local to Monroe County and as a team however much money they earn as a team that goes to them individually I donate that amount of money in their names to the Humane Society. Wow, I didn't know you were doing that. That's yeah. cool. So they're they're they, you know they're all about cats and puppies and dogs and things like that. So it's easy to get behind that. So I push that, and I do a little thermometer kind of thing. So the more money they get, they can see how much they've earned and everything. So it's a push to do it. So they're doing it for the cats and dogs. You know, they're not doing it for me, that's but that's so, kind of a push. That's so fun. Yeah, and and they love that. They love seeing that. And then at the end of the year, I go to the Humane Society with them, and they get a behind the scenes tour. Uh, they get to see what goes on behind the scenes at the public hand zoo. So the, the people at the Humane Society will give them an hour and a half tour and they get to see the dogs and cats. They get to go in the kitten room and have the kittens run all over them and things like that. That's so it's, so awesome. it's, a, it's a nice push for them and, and an incentive. Yeah, that's so awesome. that's, that's a big part of my marketing is, are those kids. The other part of it that I do is social media. You know, uh, Social media is a huge part of their life. It's 16, 17, 18 year olds. Um, Instagram is for the kids I have to get they have to know who I am so I'm on Instagram the parents have to know I am so I have to be on Facebook also it has to be a double-headed approach the parents have to want to pay for it and they have to be interested in it uh, but the kids are usually the first ones that see me and tell hey mom we got to go here so it's which don't you think because you're a parent of a teenager don't you think that's a better way <laughs> because you Absolutely. Should, yeah. normally parents are like go get your pictures taken go get your pictures go like it's this like oh, stop nagging me kind of a situation and they're so, dragging the kid along hey yeah oh, your senior portraits yeah, taken. if the kid goes like, to the oh, parent, this yeah. Is horrible. Yeah. if the student goes to the parent first they're already on board mm -hmm. and and usually the parents will be shortly after that uh, but you have to do it. And I do it consistently. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I scheduled out six weeks worth of posting. So they went up the same time. So if I died tomorrow, three more weeks of postings are going to go out. You know, so I, I, I minimize my time spent. But it's a lot of time and it's a lot of effort, but you got to do it. Totally. Have you gotten onto TikTok or any of the new ones? Or do you usually um, wait until your kids tell you you're not? I longer? have a TikTok account. <laughs> I have a Snapchat account. I don't use them as much. Yeah. Um, but I have a model team event. So I get all my models in there together here as a team. And we had a, oh my God, we had a two hours blowout session of photos and they did TikToks and they got me involved. That's, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. They probably do it for you. Yeah, they did it for me. And, and I'm going to have them do a takeover of the studio with their TikToks Ooh. and things like that. So they can do it because you know, I'm a 54 year old white guy. You know, I'm, I'm only going to be that popular in TikTok. So the kids are going to do it. I want them to have the fun. And mm -hmm. And, and you know, I, I try to have the kids like me, but if I show, if I try to have them like me, it shows. Yeah. You know, you can't be the cool guy unless they anoint you the cool guy. Yeah. You can't tell them about you the cool guy. You can't put that on right? and say, I'm exactly, cool exactly, right? So I have them tell Here's everybody. Here's a candy bar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The good thing is that you're charming and fun, so it's like easy to like you, you know? Yeah, so, I, I mean, you're, it's not like you take yourself too seriously. I don't. I'm a big yeah. kid myself, yeah. so I get along. I have a daughter who's just turned 20, so 21. Uh, so I have a kid around that age, so I, I act, I interact with them really, really well, and without trying, it just comes naturally. Uh, yeah. If you try too hard, it looks bad. Oh, for sure. So let's talk real quick. Uh, I mean, this video is going to get long, so we'll we'll wrap up soon. But um, do you have any advice for like newer photographers who aren't valuing themselves, or how you over the years listen to your gut, or any any uh, little thing that you've had to transcend? Like you know, obviously we talked about you know you're not sure about starting a studio but like any other like big thing that you think most people struggle with as a small yeah, business owner it, it's it's I, I think the biggest hurdle is self-confidence and I, I internally fight with that a little bit even though you said I look confident from the outside mm -hmm. that's the appearance I want to give but I'm always doubting myself inside um, this is a great analogy and I came up with this a little while ago there are different tiers of any profession if you're a beginner you're down here if you become intermediate you're here and if you're an expert or above you're up here and your pricing will show accordingly all right, everybody knows Tiffany's jewelry store, okay? Is Tiffany's worried that Reed's Jewelers, which is an supply, are they worried that Reed's Jewelers sells jewelry? No, they don't because they're in a different tier. Does Tiffany's and Reed's Jewelers worry that Walmart sells jewelry? No, they don't because there's a, t there's a customer base for each one of those. Mm -hmm. Now, if you consider yourself Walmart level, if you have low prices, you give things away, you're a new newbie, that's fine. Everybody, st I started there myself. All right. When you work your way up and you just and you determine that I'm not making money for the amount of time I'm putting into it, raise your prices. 
And it's a knee-jerk reaction because all of a sudden you'll find yourself in a new tier of people and you're going to lose customers because the customers you had before, are going to, I can't pay that. Okay, but now there's a whole new tier of people that will pay you. And more than you think that they And will. more than you think you will. Which is what my entire channel is about. So, so, if, you, so. if this is your first time here, stick around because right. <laughs> I show you exactly how that works. Yes. <laughs> and now people consider me the higher tier. Now, I'm, I don't consider myself... And different. I don't even consider you high tier, yeah. like as far as price. Not right. that I'm intimately knowing all your prices, but... Yeah, you'll, you'll yell at you're, me because you don't think I'm You're higher volume enough. than a lot too, though. So right. It, right. that's where you get to play with your prices and yeah. be a little more affordable or whatever. But I'm for, kind of a affordable hybrid. is relative and yeah. expensive is relative and cheap is relative. Like is. everyone has their own opinion on what that is. Right. So that's why I have a whole channel based on pricing. Right. So if you're one of those photographers that we call shoot and burn, so you shoot everything and put it on DVD and give it to them, you, we have, we've figured it out, and I think people, it, you make like two to three dollars an hour. Yeah. All right. You You're can't. basically paying your client. Right. You can't flip fries for two dollars an hour. Okay. Uh, so fight the nature aggression. Raise your prices. You're going to lose customers. You're going to go a new set of customers. Yeah. And think about it this way: if you're selling an eight by ten for two dollars, you have to sell fifty of them to make a hundred bucks. Yeah. If you're selling eight by tens for fifty dollars. You only have to sell two of them to make that same hundred dollars. Exactly. And if you're selling, and then for, a third of that goes to taxes anyway. Right. So. Right. Exactly. And if you're selling them for a hundred dollars, you don't have to do. You don't have to sell one to make that same amount of money. So, yeah. I'm going from selling fifty prints to selling one print yep. and making the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. So there are going to be people that will be an audience to whatever you're selling. Mm -hmm. so, so. Plus, yeah. as you get older, another thing I talk about on the channel is as you get older, you just can't work that hard. Like, I mean, you can work hard in different ways, but like. Just the volume of shooting, like your body, especially weddings, like it just takes a toll on your body and your mind and maybe you finally want to travel or have a family or whatever. Like you need uh, free time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. He Heather, Heather and all of our peers used to make fun of me because I would be up till 2 o'clock every morning and returning emails at 2 o'clock because mm -hmm. I only sleep. Yeah, you only sleep for 3 hours. I only slept for 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. is when I slept. Whereas and, I need like a full 8 hours. Right. Like I don't and, I even overslept today and I slept <laughs> late. And I was like, why am I yeah. sleeping so late? <laughs> and then, you know, as I get older, I realize I don't, I mean, I want to work hard. I will always yeah, get 100%. Yeah, there's nothing, I you got to work hard. hard. But yeah. I, I work smarter now. Um, I take yeah. the weekends off. I'm relaxing with a drink on the patio with my wife Whoa. once in a while. And I know you really well, so high five to you. Yes, and <laughs> you know I don't like taking it he's easy. He's not good at uh, sitting still. No, um, but I'm working at home when I do. I do it. And I used to be that, like, for a long time I was that way, which is how I've leaned into it. I'm like, I've done those years of hustle, hustle, hustle. I've learned the art of relaxation and recharging batteries and just sitting. Mm -hmm. And for me, my best hard. ideas come when I'm not actually yes. working, yeah. personally. I'm, like, something I'm, I'm stuck with just... My best ideas come when I'm brushing my teeth, I'm looking in the mirror, when I'm in the shower. Mine come when I'm on a trip. <laughs> okay. When you're doing things you don't have to think about. Yeah. Mowing 100%. my lawn, brushing yeah, my teeth. Totally. That's when all my ideas come. Like things just... And they just come. And mm -hmm. I'm spending more time on my own, uh, just, just relaxing. Mm -hmm. I'm making more money, so I don't have to work quite as hard. But also, I think having an environment like this, having this studio to come to, it's away from home, it's a job, like... It, or, you know, what? I, yeah, it's work, but, but to be able to come here and putts around and work on things. I think there's a lot of value there too. For me personally, because I'm a putzer, if I'm not in my garage order, this gives me a place to come into work. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not a trivial expense. You know, it's a sizable expense of rent to keep this space active. Um, you know, or Eastern suburbs of Rochester are the more affluent suburbs. I'm paying $16 a square foot uh, for the space and you know, to 2,300 square feet, you can figure out what I'm paying for rent. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap. Uh, but it was a worthwhile investment and it set me apart from a lot of people and there are very few studios that still have very few photographers who have studios anymore mm -hmm. and that sets me apart from most people I can work any hour of the day or night mm -hmm. we're sitting in my daylight room but I can make this look like daylight at midnight mm -hmm. I can shoot the light and work away the light so it looks still like a daylight and that gets back to being good at your craft knowing what you're doing years of experience years of practice all that stuff yep. so if it's black clouds and raining outside it's still gonna look like a nice sunny day in here mm -hmm. So, so, so let's pivot real quick because most of the people who watch my channel, uh, what I talk about obviously is selling products because yes. I love tangible products. Um, just share like a, any little tip on how to pick your product mix or what you personally like to sell or anything along those lines. Like any thoughts there? Yeah, I'm very much in the same mindset. I want something tangible in their hands. I don't want, the, I don't want to email digital files because there's no value in the digital file. Um, you know, even if you put it on a thumb drive, there's some value to it. I want to have them have print in their hand 
an album in their hand or a print on the wall. You know, I, I unfortunately experienced a, a, a loss early in my, in my life where I realized pictures are the only things you have after in the long run. And, and so I want pictures in people's hands. So, and, I, and sometimes I tell people about my experience of why I love this so much. And they understand it. I'm not pushing because I want a big sale. I'm pushing it because emotionally this is all I have left of a family member that I lost a long time ago. And so it's important for me. Uh, and, and I speak from the heart when I do that. Uh, I don't want to give out digital products. I have people ask me about it. I just had someone this morning. Can I get a CD of all my files? No. You can buy digital files if that's what you want. Or if you buy a higher package, I include a phone app that has images. Mm -hmm. through that. And haven't you found it sets you apart also? It does. Because I does. found it's always set me apart. Yeah. And when, they, when I place an album in their hand and they feel like, oh my God, this is really it's, nice. And, yeah. and they open it up and they're, it's 1114 album and their eyes go like this. The money start, they spent just... Yeah. Disappears. Right. And they start crying <laughs> because they can't believe what they're holding in their hands. Mm -hmm. you, have you ever gotten that from the digital file on your phone? No. It, it doesn't happen. No. My clients re regularly, because again, I'm a wedding photographer, not a portrait photographer, but my clients regularly tell me I'll get random emails years late after the wedding from people I don't even talk to anymore. And they say that their wedding album is their kid's favorite bedtime story. Yeah. It's like, nice. can I get that on video? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's just so cute. And it, but it, it gets back to the whole point. And it also is a differentiator for your business too. Like any, everybody, even triple photographers, it'll give out files. Yeah, and, and it does it make me more expensive? Yes. Does it set me apart? Yes. And but it, you're also more valuable because of it, because you actually are taking care of your client fully, which is right. what I'm always driving home on my right. channel. Even if you give away high res, or they buy high res files from you, are they going to do anything with those files? No, they want them for their phone. Right. So or you Facebook. My wall portraits come framed with framing hardware on it so they can put it up on the wall five minutes after they get home. Yeah. And I don't say, oh, here, you can frame yourself. Here, go to go to this frame place because it's going to sit under their bed or in our closet yeah. for six months or a year. It's going to gather dust before they forget that they have it. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, if you're spending the money, it's an investment, get it up right away. Do you, put, do you install... Uh, your I have I have clients. I mean, it's not something always I do, but okay. I have older. Well, a lot clients. of your clients live nearby. They too, live nearby. And they've yep. gone through the process before, so they're probably okay hanging. Yeah, in the but office. I have I have older couples who just can't manage it, or they don't want to do it. I'm afraid I'm going to ruin something. I'm, mm -hmm. I will do that for them. Yeah. I mean, I, I always consider myself. Uh, I have a hundred percent guarantee and everything, yeah. and consider myself full service. So if I have to go to someone's home and hang a thirty by forty portrait. I will do that. Yeah. Or if I have to deliver something, if it's raining or whatever, they can't get out, I deliver stuff to my It gets clients. back to being full service. Yes. Yeah. And you're pretty high volume too, so that says a lot. It's, I'm high volume and high price. So. And that's what I'm always, that's why you're here, because I'm always trying to drill that home on my channel, that yeah. that is what everyone wants to get to. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know. And I was never fully able to get to high volume with yeah. my high prices, which yeah. is more me, because I'm one person and I, I need eight hours of sleep. Yep. <laughs> so yeah. that's part and, of it. And <laughs> if, you're, if you're really high priced. But I was you, fine. You know? Yeah, if you're really high priced, you don't have to be high volume. If mm -hmm. you want to relax more. The but it would have been great if I had had like maybe five years of just like yeah. being at my own personal max. Yes. And the pricing I've been at. My trouble is I enjoy photography. Yeah, you love it. You know, and people will say, I have a passion for photography. Yeah. And that's an overused word because everybody has a passion. Yeah. A passion is not... And passions come and go. Yes. <laughs> Which passion is, is not... Passion take pictures doesn't mean you're going to give everything as a good photographer. Mm -hmm. I love packaging. I love framing. I love retouching, unfortunately. Yeah. I love all Oh, I hate that. retouching. So I'm a kid yeah. in a candy store. Every day is Christmas Day when I get to come yeah. to the studio. Plus you so. get to build things. And right. So I don't mind working yeah. 40 to 60 hours. And on my busy times, I've worked 80 hours a week mm -hmm. uh, to do that. I don't mind putting. That's why I become high volume because I still enjoy what I do. Yeah. And if, I always, if I'm only concerned about the money, I would cut back and only make money. Yeah. You know, I am I am now grossing one hundred and fifty to one hundred seventy five thousand a year. Yeah, uh, my net isn't that, but I'm grossing sure. that, yeah. uh, and comparatively, I'm I'm making a I'm making a good salary. Yeah, and you're just so fulfilled. You don't have weird coworkers. Yeah, yeah. Or coffee yes. aside from me coming by, right. you don't have. Water I only have myself to bitch at, right? <laughs> you <have people laughs> Which I do quite a time. bit. I do. Yes, I talk to myself and I bitch myself all the time. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Cool. Awesome. All right. So I just want to wrap up uh, and say thank you so much because we've been talking about doing this for years. You've been warning me this is going to happen. Yeah, for years. yeah, but now with COVID, you're finally slow enough. So we. <laughs> I can actually come by and, and uh, do those too. So what we're going to do next is we're going to do a quick studio tour. So stick around. Uh, we'll do a very, very quick. We'll just do, go through the studio, just give you a lay of the land in case you're interested in become a, a full service portrait photographer. 
Um, if you're watching this and you got a lot out of this, or if you want to contact Pat, feel free to like leave something in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe because then YouTube will find more content just like this for you. Um, so do you have any parting thoughts on like, again, any more warnings for people or just like... I'm, I'm going to steal the Nike Logan okay. slogan. Just do it. Yeah, there you go. I just like it. do it. Just get do it. Over or yourself. don't do it. Yeah, or, don't do something yeah, else. <laughs> exactly. Get over yourself. Yeah. Make the leap. Yeah, yeah. And just do it if you need. Yeah. I love it. Yay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yay. All right. Thanks, everybody.